because that's that's be real if it weren't for those kind of advertisement promising you know you'll get rich quick most people wouldn't have gotten into trading you know if you had told me that this is something i have to grind for two years you know on, on top of working my job and like spend like 10 hours a week working on trading and i might lose you know a couple thousand dollars doing that i probably wouldn't have looked into trading <laughs> I'm, I'm thankful, to be honest. Like, it sucks that I lost a lot of money, but I think everyone has to go through that. Markets, speculation, and risk. This is the Chat with Traders podcast. And we're now on episode 261. This is Tessa, co-host of Chat with Traders. After you've listened to an episode that really speaks to you, for example, you may have picked up some great ideas or golden nuggets, what do you tend to do about it? In other words, how do you apply what speaks to you? Do you connect with someone and discuss it? Or do you take notes and turn it into something actionable to experiment, test, and maybe incorporate and apply into your trading routine, process, or strategy? Or do you find that months later, you've already forgotten all about it? Do you find that there's just so much great information out there that it can get so overwhelming and hard to focus and maybe you don't even know where to start? Or perhaps you were just listening to a podcast more for entertainment anyway. I've always wondered about this and I'm just asking it now. What do you do after listening to an episode that speaks to you? Feel free to reach out to us on chatwithtraders.com and share your thoughts. Now, I want to focus on our next guest today, who probably needs no introduction in the trading community. Her name is Shay, also known as Humble Trader on her YouTube channel. You know, I am personally inspired by the ordinariness of her journey, and I mean that in a good way. I think she speaks trading and her experience like it is, and it resonates with so many traders in the trading community. Her journey represents many who are working full-time or their primary job, who have been looking for a change in their current situation and somehow discovered trading and have been inspired along the way. Like many, Shay was seduced by advertisements of easy money, but eventually learned that she had to find her own path and way of trading. Taking the skills she learned as a special effects artist in Hollywood, she created the popular YouTube channel Humble Trader, and there's nothing ordinary here, by the way, where she shares her trading experiences and wisdoms in a humorous and creative way that really sticks with her audience. Join Ian Cox in his interview with Shay, the woman behind Humbled Trader. Ladies and gentlemen, we are so pleased to present Shay from Vancouver, Canada. Well, Shay, otherwise known as Humbled Trader, welcome to chat with traders. Thanks for having me. Hello, everyone. Hi, Tessa. Hi, Ian. Yeah, nice to nice to have you. So where are you? Uh, where are you now? I am from Taiwan. That's where I grew up. Uh, I'm co- currently uh, located in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, I immigrated to Canada when I was 12. Uh, and then since then, I kind of, you know, been between the States and Vancouver for college, for work, uh, over the last couple of years, and now I'm back in Vancouver. How is it adapting to Canadian culture, learning English uh, in your early years? Um, it was a little bit tough. I'm not going to lie. I think the best time to immigrate or to, I guess, move to a whole new country is when you are a lot younger. Uh, and by the age of 12, it's like that awkward age where you move there, I am in grade seven, and then the next year you go to high school. So it wasn't the smoothest transition. Uh, yeah, trying to learn English, trying to make friends at the same time. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't it's, it's not the easiest thing to do. Uh, so it was tough. It was tough the first couple of years in Canada. Did you have any particular uh, favorite subjects that you like to dive into uh, when you're in high school or was it, were you just struggling to kind of just adapt to the culture and learn the language? I I was always really good uh, with arts. Like I'm a really creative person. So that's kind of where I used to escape. I would like hide in the arts room at lunch because no one would eat lunch with me and I didn't know who to hang out with. So I'll hide in the arts room um that's kind of like my safe place that's kind of why I eventually went to art school went to film 
after after high school. I, I'm always kind of very introverted, uh, to be honest. So that's kind of my escape to to be to be frank. Uh, my escape to not have to you know worry about meeting people or talking to people in English. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, early on, when you were in high school and in college, uh, did your family or friends have? Um, were they into like investing or trading? No, no. Um, I I didn't know anything about the stock market until after college. Um, you know, early on, no one in my family, no one in my friends group knew anything about the stock market. My parents didn't have the extra money to think about the stock market or investing. So what did you major in in, in university? Uh, I was in film. So I was I studied uh, 3D animation mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> in film, very different from what I'm doing now. But that's why I got started with like all the videos and all that fun stuff. Uh, were you like an editor of film and special effects? Is that it? Uh, well, you know, in the in the modern day movies, like a lot of Hollywood blockbusters you see a lot of like 3d effects right it's all green screen for example uh you know any marvel movie the backgrounds the vehicles the the monsters the heroes all of that is green screened so i'll be the people who design uh what the costumes look like what the environment looks like what the spaceships look like um everything will be in 3d so that's kind of uh, kind of my former career in VFX. We call it VFX artists or designers. Well, what did you like and dislike about your job? At first, I liked it for the creativity. Um, at first, uh, it was really cool because you're essentially working on film sets. Uh, you get to see like the next room, they'll be filming um, some shots in front of uh, the green screen. And then you'll be editing and kind of planning planning out with the 3D effects in the next room and building out the environments in 3D. So I had a really, really technical background uh, using all the different softwares, lighting, texturing, uh, to create these like computer generated images, CGI. Um, that's the part I enjoyed. Uh, to be able to work so closely with a film set, and the, it's a big production, so you get to work with directors, sometimes actors, um, actresses, of course. That's a part I enjoyed at first. Um, but what I don't like is the long hours, uh, because film productions are very, very hectic. Sometimes you work six days a week from nine to nine. You know, it's not the best condition because in order to work on these CGI sets, the green screens, you have to work in really dark rooms. You don't get any natural light uh, and the hours are brutal. So you'll work like this for, you know, two, three months. And then the contract will end and you're on your own to look for the next contract. Mm -hmm. So it's not really stable and it's not a healthy environment long term. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sounds like you you weren't getting much um, sunlight. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I still don't, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, while you were working there, did you start saving and or investing? Did you do anything like that? Yeah, so it's because my job wasn't that stable. So during the weeks or months of break in between work, in between the contract, that's where I started looking at other ways to supplement my income. I was living in Los Angeles at a time and rent was really expensive and still is. Um, but I, I need to find ways to make some income to be able to pay rent. So that's where I kind of stumbled upon day trading, swing trading and the stock market as a way to try to make some money to make sure, you know, like I, I have something coming in in between jobs. Did you get into trading before actually uh, any investing or or did you get into investing before trading? At the time, I didn't really understand the difference, to be honest. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, I remember back then the first it was when Robinhood, the, the, the trading app was in like the beta version. So I got one of those like priority invitation codes from my friends. So I started buying stocks in and out on my little Robinhood account on my phone. Uh, and I thought that was investing. So I was like buying Apple today and then selling it next week. But in hindsight, I was swing trading at the time. 
Uh, but I thought that was the same as investing. But that's kind of like the gateway for me to, uh, you know, seeing what the stock market is like and trying to make like a little bit of money here and there. So when did you open up your first uh, trading account? Uh, the Robinhood app <laughs> was, I think, 2013. End of 2013, that's when they had the, the beta version. And then the a real trading account where I opened up was with Interactive Brokers was 2014. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So were you uh, enticed by any uh, grandiose claims by these promoters uh, on the mm-hmm. internet? Uh, uh, did you, and how did you educate yourself? I joined a bunch of chat rooms, the, the ones that give you alerts to buy and sell because I thought I would be able to make money really quickly. So that's what I joined. And, you know, a, a factor was all my friends were going to EDC Las Vegas one summer. So I really want to go to VIP with them. Um, so that's where I was, okay, like I've been saving up, you know, some small amounts of money here and there. Uh, let me kind of place a little bit more trades to see if I can make enough to buy a VIP ticket um, with my trading. But and with all the chat room alerts I was, I was I was following, I'll make a small amount of money here and there. But when I lose, I'll wipe everything out. You know, at first it was really rocky for sure. And I lost a lot of money <laughs> with my first few accounts on my uh, interactive brokers. So you ended up blowing up accounts or you did, did you just slowly drain your account over time? Oh, I, I blew up. <laughs> oh, I blew okay. up. Yeah. The first account, I think I blew up after two weeks. It was oh, like wow. a $2,000 account. And then that's when I realized, oh my God, that's, that's $2,000 I just lost. And it took me a long time to save it. So I, I realized I was pretty reckless really quick. So when I refunded the account, I, I, I toned it down a lot. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So what were you trading early on? Like um, any particular type of stocks or strategies? Or were you just simply buying whatever the chat room told you to buy? I was buying whatever the chat room told me to buy. <laughs> and mm-hmm. then it was like these like penny stocks. Mm-hmm. Um, and then a lot of the $1, $2 stocks uh, at the time, uh, like super small cap, sometimes really low float. That's kind of my introduction to the stock market. A lot of I'm sure there were a lot of pump and dumps, but I didn't know that. I just, I, everything was so random back then. I didn't understand why a stock will go up when, you know, the chat room say to buy at $2 or go up right away. And when I bought it, it was down at $150. I didn't, I didn't understand why. Uh, mm-hmm. So that was a lot of trial and error in my first year, for sure. Did you feel that you were part of, a community in this chat room? Uh, did you have any mentors? Um, how did you feel at that time of uh, being connected to the trading world? No, there's usually these kind of chat rooms, there's no such thing as anyone teaching you or mentoring you because the whole point is it's supposed to be easy, right? The whole point is you're supposed to just follow and buy whatever they buy and sell when they sell. And that's it. That's supposed to be the amount of effort needed. So I didn't, I didn't feel any sense of, oh, I was learning, uh, at least in my first six months. I didn't realize that, oh, I need to like put work into this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> did you share with your family or friends that you started uh, trading? A little bit at first, but then I stopped because everyone just said I was gambling. And, and, and in hindsight, I was with the alerts. That was totally gambling. Um, but I, I, I kind of stopped sharing and I kept it to myself because I just didn't want other people saying, oh, I shouldn't do this. We shouldn't do that. Like, I'm just gambling. It's uh, especially later on when I started to take it more seriously. I just didn't want the negativity to kind of hold me back. Right. Did your family or friends notice any change in your personality when you took some of these big losses? I'm I'm sure my family did because <laughs> uh, I, I, I used to have some anger issues um, and I, I kind of would take it out on them, unfortunately, regrettably. Um, wow. Yeah. So I, I'm sure they know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I'm not proud of it. Yeah. I used um, to take it out on them, yell at them. Um, and then I, I had some, you know, keyboards that I used to smash my keyboards around. <laughs> uh, and mouses as well. And uh-huh. I later realized maybe I shouldn't do that. It's kind of getting expensive. <laughs> yeah. <right>. yeah. 
<laughs> so do you think uh, trading can bring us closer to our repressed emotions? I think trading reveals whatever you already have inside. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, if, if a trader already was struggling with some sort of, um, you know, any relationship issues in life or if you were before trading, if you were already financially stressed, I think trading will bring all of that out, uh, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And if you have any sort of like inside insecurity and that's OK, but trading will bring it out to you. Um, I didn't think I was an angry person before until I started trading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned in uh, one of your videos that uh, mm -hmm. anger is a secondary emotion. And yeah. it's there to protect us. Um, yeah. Care to elaborate on that? Yeah. So I think it's a, it's kind of like our, well, I'm no psychologist, but in my opinion, it's kind of like our, our own inner reflection of like, it's our instinct to kind of lash out whenever we feel like we're vulnerable. So let's say if I take a big loss, that's a huge hit to my ego. So to react to that, to kind of protect myself, I have to, I have to like lash out at the others and kind of express and yell and, you know, at other people to kind of react to that emotion because to those losses, because if I don't, then that means, you know, I have to take responsibility for myself. And most people don't want to do that. They don't believe that when they lose money in trading, it's their own fault. I used to blame it on the markets, blame it on the market makers. Oh, all the slippage is the market makers. It's not my fault. No, at the end of the day, it's just me not following the stops. Mm -hmm. So I think I come to terms with that. I'm a lot better now. I don't really yell or smash my mouses or keyboards anymore. So I, I kind of dealt with this over the last couple of years. I, I take a lot more responsibility for my own losses now. Unfortunately, every trader has to go through this. <laughs> you suffered some losses. You said you blew up one account uh, with $2,000. Um, after that, how did things go? Did you end up uh, having any major losses after that? Enough to make you seriously consider quitting? Yeah, so... After that first account, I still lost a couple more accounts, but it's not major blow ups. It's just slow bleed of like small losses here and there. So I probably lost another two, two, two thousand dollars accounts, um, but no major blow ups after the first one. The biggest blow up that happened was actually after I became profitable, um, because that's when kind of I've been slowly build up my account size. I was getting ready. This is, um, this is in at the end of year two. I was actually a lot more consistent. I found um, two strategies that I would just play in and out. I was getting ready to kind of size up more and take it to the next level and eventually be able to quit my job to do this. But that's when <laughs> that's when I uh, had a really, really big blow up because I think, you know, once you become profitable, you see how far you've come. A lot of traders, they become cocky. And I was definitely one of those people. So yeah. did you have a, a pretty long winning streak prior to this big blow up? And share with us a little bit about this blow up. Like what what trade did you do and, and what happened? It was it's kind of embarrassing because I was essentially bag holding. Um, it was a day trade turned into a swing trade. Um, so I was stuck upside down short on Snapchat for mm -hmm. a long time. So it, it, it was after, after they IPO'd, um, I did a lot of fundamental research on all my day trades at the time, and I was trying to short it to single digits. Um, and it went to a single digits and bounced. And that's why I started adding in more and more. Um, I didn't follow my stops and that turned into a swing trade short, and then I just kept on adding more size. So uh, when after I closed it out, I, I've been holding the, the position for almost two months, uh, essentially. It was a back holding position. Um, and, and unfortunately, like, that just broke all my rules. I, 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 you know, I was strictly a day trader. I didn't swing trade that much. Um, I broke all my rules. I held a losing position, turned a day trade into a losing trade. I added to a loser. I was using, you know, more than the amount of size I normally would take. 
on a stock that's clearly uptrending on a daily chart. So yeah, when this is the the biggest blow up for me at that time. This was around forty seven thousand dollars over the course of almost two months, and that was really painful, <laughs> not to say the least. Oh yeah, I bet. Yeah. Were were you uh, uh, encouraged or enticed? to stay in the trade because you were looking at perhaps some company fundamentals and looked at my God, look at how overvalued this company is or, or they're not making much money. Um, w- did mm-hmm. you follow fundamentals at all uh, in this particular company? So for day trading, you know, usually, yes, I, every day I do some really quick fundamental analysis, but for day trading, you don't need to do anything that in depth, generally speaking, um, so since we're holding this position for so, so short term, you know, you just need, usually need to know, uh, you know, what the company does, you know, overall, are they profitable or not? Um, any, any, you know, if there's a small cap, any potential dilution, that's kind of the extent I do. Um, but unfortunately w- the, the thing with adding to losers and bag holding is that the more, money you've sunk into it, the more losses, unrealized loss you're holding, the more research you do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do you, you find more and more things to justify bag holding mm-hmm. the stock? Yes. Yep. Been there. <laughs> yep. So I will, so I would, yes, like, like you said, I would justify it with, oh, Snapchat's not profitable. Come on. Like, you know, this is, this is like, you know, this is something that only the teenagers use. They're not profitable. They're burning so much cash. There's no way this is going back to $20. So, I mean, those were just excuses, to be honest. I, I should have just stopped out because, uh, because, because I was just breaking rules at the end of the day and didn't want to admit I was wrong and realize that loss. So yeah. uh, after that loss, did did you consider seriously quitting? Uh, I mean, what kind of, and if so, what made you come back? In my, in the course of uh, the first four years of trading, even after I became uh, trading full-time, I, I considered uh, quitting many times. Um, and I quit many times, but there were two times that's very seriously uh, that, oh, I was going to quit and, you know, just go back to my VFX job. Um, and that was one of those situations where, okay, I'm done. And then I, I did go and uh, look for another contract. That's another four weeks contract on another movie at a time. Um, and yeah, I thought I was, I was done with trading and that was it. You know, I go back to my regular film career and try to make it work. I see. So you hadn't uh, completely quit. You just were trading in between contracts. Is that accurate? No, basically, I just stopped taking contracts. So I was, oh, I see. yeah, so I will go, I went back to my work, take up two contracts twice um, with the intention of knowing, ba- never going back to trading. But every time, you know, like I get that itch because we're on the West Coast. I go to work at night, so technically I can wake up early every morning and study the market and trade. So even though when I wasn't trading, I was still waking up early to watch the markets. Like I, I just get really, really drawn to the market. Um, even though I was determined to quit, I was still waking up and watch the market every day. <laughs> oh wow! So, yeah. so the market still fascinated you and kept you um, intrigued, even while you were thinking about quitting. Yeah. And even after I thought I quit, I was still watching the market. Uh Um, I think, you know, going back to work, it was fine. Like I was getting paid again, but I, it's very hard to go back to your regular, for me, it was nine to seven or nine to nine job after you have had a taste of the freedom and the potential that trading can give you. It's very Mm. difficult to go back. I see. Oh yeah. I yeah. yes. So uh, that's why I returned to try to make it work so many times. Mhm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd like to ask you about your uh your YouTube channel. Uh when did you get into uh creating YouTube uh videos and what inspired you to get into that? Yeah, so the channel was created in 20 mid 2019. Um so since then since the 2016 blow up that's been a couple of years and I was, you know, trading full time, a lot more consistent, a lot more less stupid losses. 
like a Snapchat one. Once in a while, I still slip. Not gonna lie, I'm human after all. Yeah. Uh, but the channel was a way for me to have a creative outlet because when I used to have my job in film and VFX, I I still you know have some sort of creative input in my life and you know some sort of creative challenge. Um, so that's why I was very skilled with videos, storytelling, and design as well. So when I kind of was missing that in my day to day trading full time, I realized I needed something to distract myself. Ideally, a side project that's creative for me to focus on midday after I'm done trading. Because what happens is I used to trade from so market opens my time at six thirty uh, on the west coast. So I'll trade till about uh, my local time nine or ten o'clock. And then after that, I'm just throwing money back to the market.、Mm-hmm. If I sit sit around and I stare at the, the the market screens, so the YouTube channel is a way for me to be creative, have a side project, do something fun that I used to enjoy a lot when it wasn't work, and、uh, distract myself. In, in a way, the YouTube channel saved me so much money because I will shut down my computer, shut down my brokerage account, and focus on. Making these like little videos that I really, really enjoy and find it fun on the side. Do you think that your YouTube channel、uh, helped you in any way to hold yourself accountable for your your own trading? Yeah, for sure.、Um, I think if you have to talk about your trades, recap your trades, and talk about these like really important ideas to other people, summarizing a video. It, it's kind of it's kind of positive reinforcement where okay I just talked about risk management in a video then the next day you know when I'm trading about to do some stupid stuff how can I do that when when you know I just told a thousand other people watching my videos that you should follow your stops <laughs> right so it's a I think the the YouTube channel I'm sure, I'm glad it helped a lot of people but really it's a way to help me、uh, stay very disciplined. To my plans, my rules, and know when to call it a day and be done with trading. I I noticed that uh, uh, since you created your YouTube account,、uh, mm-hmm. it looks like it was just about two months. You already had videos、uh, that、mm-hmm. would get well over a hundred thousand views, and now after over three hundred and fifty videos,、mm-hmm. a million subscribers, and some videos getting over a million views. When many other trading、um, videos by other people only get a fraction of that,、uh, mm. of the amount of views that you get, what do you think the、uh, appeal is? Well, well, first of all, thank you.、Um, but I don't think I hit that much views that fast.、Um, like it's a slow trajectory. Like it's something that I really, really like doing, and people see the work I put into. And editing and video creation came naturally to me thanks to my former career. But I think the biggest thing why people like my videos is because I I don't sugarcoat it,、um, and I usually talk about my experiences of why I had such big losses and why most people will have losses and kind of what you should expect as a new trader going into trading, kind of set some realistic、um, expectations for people. Otherwise, what without some real, real reality check, most people would. Think you know what? I, the same reason I was drawn to the market is I thought I was gonna make money right away, and you know, be able to drive Lamborghinis in six months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you、I、do was, have. Was thrown around. I mean, it still is being thrown around, right? <laughs> oh yeah, you you、uh, in many of your videos you do make fun、uh, of the、uh, Lamborghini money, and <laughs> I was just curious if.、Uh, If you had any experience, then、uh, in these chat rooms that you talked about,、uh, whether they pr- promoted、uh, Lamborghini money and and、uh, f- a easy way to fast wealth, did you get exposed to that kind of、uh, promotional hype、uh, early on? Oh yeah, that's what was drawn. I was drawn uh, to it. Uh, I mean, the couple of chat rooms I was in, you know, usually there's a huge. Uh, banner of a、uh, the guy in front of Lamborghinis. <laughs> It's like bright orange, bright blue. I mean, that's that's the everyone's seen the ad, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, I noticed one of the videos that you have, uh, uh, it's, it's quite funny, where you actually got a, um, I think it was a green Lamborghini and, yeah. uh, and made a, a, a skit on that, um, uh, kind of making fun of that whole, uh, yeah, that whole hype crowd. So did you feel uh, in any way, did you feel tricked by these kind of grandiose promises or, or uh, uh, you know, of a rich future by these chat rooms? A little bit tricked. But to be honest, I think this is every trader's rite of passage because because you kind of have to go through that to uh, to kind of to kind of understand. Oh, I have to put work into this, so I have no regrets. To be honest, I I, I feel really thankful now looking back because that's let's be real. If it weren't for those kind of advertisement promising, you know, you'll get rich quick, most people wouldn't have gotten into trading. And, you know, if you had told me that this is something I have to grind for two years, you know, on on top of working my job and I spend like 10 hours a week working on trading and I might lose, you know, a couple thousand dollars doing that, I probably wouldn't have looked into trading. (laughs) Uh huh. So I'm, 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 I'm thankful to be honest, like it sucks. I lost a lot of money, but I think everyone has to go through that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in your videos, you you definitely seem to have a, a natural flair for acting. Uh, did you <laughs> did you learn any of this um, uh, in your VFX job, getting exposed to actors and actresses, or uh, did you start any plays or anything like that, or is this kind of like a hidden talent that came out as a process of this YouTube channel? I, I think it's uh, it's 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 just something that. Because you have to understand, like, I'm I'm naturally introverted. So the only way where I feel comfortable to talk is if I'm at home by myself in front of the camera. So it would be very different if I was in front of a lot of people. I wouldn't be able to do the same thing. Um, this is what introverts usually do. Like, they're only talkative when they're by themselves talking to a camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you put me in front of the crowd, I, I, uh, I, I don't know what I would do. <laughs> uh so with a million subscribers, um, I imagine some people are quite curious uh, whether your YouTube channel mm-hmm. usually generates significantly more or less income than you can get from trading. Oh, my God. I wish I made more from YouTube. Uh-huh. And that's a fair question. But mm-hmm. it doesn't it's not as much as people think. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, on an average day, I probably like the YouTube will probably make like $200, which is good. Like two hundred dollars. Like if you do this for like the entire year, is how much? Hundred seventy seventy thousand. Seventy thousand. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's decent. Like somebody technically can live on that, but for me, uh, it's it's not like it's it's not as much as I need or want to make. Um. So the majority of my income is still from trading. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, now that I have a videographer and I have someone who helped me with the videos. So like all the AdSense revenue goes to my team. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So, so do it's you... kind of why I'm investing back, back into the YouTube channel, essentially. I see. So all those special effects that you put into your videos, um, do you do that? I used to. In my oh. first year of YouTube, I had no help. It was just me doing it. But nowadays, I have a videographer and an editor. I see. It saves you quite a bit of time then. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, great. I'd like to uh, move on to transitioning mm-hmm. to being a part-time trader mm-hmm. with a full-time job. Uh, so when you were trading while you were working, um, did you focus? I mean, how did you manage your time to be able to trade? Did you focus in on narrow areas of the market or just certain time frames? What did you do? This is where I, I feel really blessed and grateful that I'm living on the West Coast time zone because, yeah, if you're from in LA, Vancouver, Seattle, San Fran, you can, well, you have to wake up early to prepare for the market. So I used to wake up at 5 a.m. Nowadays, I wake up at 4.30, but 5 a.m. to 6 o'clock is kind of like the, the studying and the planning part, doing all the research. So I used to do that every day. So from and then from 6:30 to to 8:30 is when I'll actively trade. So after that then I'll go to work. Mm-hmm. I see. Yeah. So 
any tips to consider for our part-time traders um, who do have a full-time job? You have to, well, ideally you get to work from home. That wasn't a thing back then in 2014, 2015. But nowadays, I think a lot of employers are pretty flexible. So you can talk to your employer, negotiate whether you can work from home half of the week and be able to kind of manage your time between work and trading. So block off certain time slots for trading. Um, If you're on the East Coast, it's a little bit tough, but um, I talk to traders who schedule to start the actual nine to five at 11 a.m. market time on the East Coast. And they just focus on trading from eight o'clock to 11. Mm-hmm. So I it's see. doable, but you have to be very, very, um, very productive with your, with your time and really good at managing and, and time blocking. Did you ever calculate the percentage annual return? that you would need to replace your working income so you so that you could transition from a full-time job to a full-time trader mm, so it wasn't i didn't use percentage but i use a, a hard number so at the time when i was in la i was making about in u.s dollars probably like 60k per year mm-hmm. and and by the way 60k is like including all the all the crazy overtime so it's not a lot of money Um, Sometimes I work 12 hour days, but 60K per year. So at a time, I just want to have, you know, at the time I calculated my income, sorry, my living expenses, which was around 25K per year. And for one person at the time, that's, you know, nowadays that's probably not enough, but back then it was. So for me, I just want to have one whole year of money saved up from trading and sitting in my bank account. So I want to be able to have that liquid cash, 25K in my account. That's when I know that I, I, I'm ready to trade full time. I see. So yeah. so that sounds like a good uh, uh, point for uh, traders to consider is have that runway, right? Have that mm-hmm. buffer uh, yeah. so that you don't um, have the pressure of mm-hmm. having to make your rent money, you know, every day weighing down on you. Yeah. Yeah. This needs to be separate from your trading account. Cause at the time, I, I believe at the time when I quit, I was trading with a 40 K um, trading account and then a 25 K for living is out. In, it's in my bank account. So keep it separate. I see. So how many years after, so you started trading, is it around 2013? Is that correct? Mm-hmm, yes. And then uh, you started trading full time about around what year? I started trading full-time three years after, so in 2016. 2016. Okay, so you had three years of experience yeah. uh, to go mm-hmm. on, and you had a, a year's worth of um, expenses saved up. Yes. Okay, yeah. great. Transitioning to being a full-time trader. So you, you quit your job in 2016, right, and started trading full-time? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Did you share share any of this with family or friends? <laughs> <laughs> well, I kind of waited a little bit. I eventually told them, but I told them after well into my first year of full-time trading when, you know, at first you're going to have some rocky months whenever like, I went full, when I went full-time, there's some rocky months where, you know, I wasn't sure if it's going to work or like a break-even month. Um, but once you get into the flow of things, then I realized, okay, like I should just treat trading the exact same way as if I was still trading part-time because that's kind of what I was used to after the first, after three years of practice, right? So I have to treat it the exact same way, um, use the same routine. Nothing much has to change Mm -hmm. besides the fact that I'm not going to work at nine o'clock anymore. I see. So did you expand your trading hours that you would do the trades because now you're just doing it full time? Uh, Or did you still keep to trading in the morning and then uh, working on YouTube videos maybe in the afternoon? Did you keep to that same kind of schedule? Yeah. So at first, when I first started trading full time, I would trade the entire day. And I realized, you know, this is pretty stupid. I'm throwing away a lot of profits after after my local time, 10 a.m., so that's where I kind of, you know, to know YouTube is one of the things that I started doing as a side project to distract myself. 
But at the time, I also did a lot of other things. Like I did a lot of online businesses with my friends. I was into real estate, um, did some home house flipping, everything, like all these like side, side hustles I was doing was just to make sure I occupied well after 10 a.m. and don't give back my profits. So even now, that's still the best time for me to trade before nine o'clock, to be honest. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, can you share with us a little bit about your your bread and butter typical trades that you do? Yeah, so that kind of evolves over the years. Um, I used to trade a lot of small caps, um, but nowadays I trade more on the large cap side um, because this year and last year, the large caps have been so volatile uh, and, and I love it. Um, so what I like, my bread, bread and butter setup is whenever there's a huge gap on the on a large cap stock, huge gap up or huge gap down. I prefer the gap ups, um, usually due to earnings or any sort of news catalyst that's positive for the stock. Um, so I will see the gap up pre market, and then usually if you look at any huge gap ups, they, there's usually some sort of profit taking at the open or sometimes pre market, um, and then I will identify that. Um, and my what I like to do is to to long to buy the reversal after it's did the profit taking. Let's say, for example, retracing thirty percent of the overnight gap, then I'll go long and buy the reversal back to the pre market highs. I see. And then uh, when you have a dip, say on on an earnings miss, for example, mm-hmm. uh, do you short at the open or like kind of what are you looking for uh, to go long or short? Yeah, so earnings miss, it kind of depends um, on how the chart is set up. So if it sometimes earnings miss and it gaps down, that kind of just ruins the play. So if a stock has gapped down way too much, I, I don't like to trade it. Um, but unless it does like a, um, if the earnings is really a miss and they missed on all metrics, EPS, revenue, guidance, and then I'll even listen to the conference calls. So that's a really quick, uh, like fundamental analysis I'll do on the stock. Um, the calls sometimes can take a little bit longer, but I'll tune in and listen to it. Um, and usually for the for the tech stocks, especially the the recent ones, um, it's very really sensitive to what the expect what what the actual earnings are versus the expectation. So a lot of times that's where you can see the surprise factor. Whether it's a negative surprise or a positive surprise, if it's a huge miss, then sometimes the stock doesn't even bounce for you to find an entry to short. Um, but then if it's like a really, really bad earnings, I'll try to find entries here and there to short. Essentially, you're joining the trend to the downside. Like that's when you see like a huge bleed out. The stock will literally fade the entire day. Do you find that uh, the big cap stocks that you go long on on breakouts or short on a say earnings miss, uh, do you find them more suitable for holding for multiple days or weeks, or are you just simply strictly get in and get out the same day? Yeah, I still prefer to just day trade them. Um, I used to hold some of the stocks overnight, uh, but I would say since since twenty twenty two. Uh, I think the overnight gap up and downs, this it's a little bit too irrational. Everything is so headline sensitive now. I just don't like the overnight risk. So I don't hold much overnight anymore. Mm-hmm. What was your uh, transition from small caps to large caps um, heavily influenced by liquidity drying up uh, over the last year, year and a half? Yes. And also... Also, I was reviewing my journal at the end of, I believe, 2021. Um, that's why I realized, okay, like small caps, when it's great, like especially the multi-day runners, you can make a lot of money. But I also look at my losses on the small caps. It's just like, oh man, like if I just take out small caps altogether, I will have a much, much you know, maybe I won't be green by much more, but it will be a lot less stress, uh, a lot less stressful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I was looking at, you know, like the small caps, trading them all together, the wins and losses. It's not adding that much extra to my overall PNL, and the large caps are just so much more. I wouldn't say easy, but they're a little bit more predictable than the small uh-huh. caps. Um. So that's when I started thinking, okay, maybe I should just 
it only trade the small cast when I see something really, really good set up instead of trying to make it work every single day. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Right. You, you mentioned in one of your videos that uh, being in tune with your emotions is an integral part of achieving success in the market. Mm -hmm. How much of this do you think is just simply tied to the position size to optimize your posi position size so you don't get too emotional, but you well, have some skin in the game? Mm, I, I think, uh, uh, yeah, I think some of it. But usually when someone gets really emotional when they add sizes, you, you want to be somewhat, you want to be a little bit uncomfortable, but you shouldn't be emotional. If you're emotional after adding size, it means you add it way too big, too fast. So mm -hmm. if I'm normally trading, let's say, you know, a thousand share lots on the stock, I, I wouldn't overnight change it to 2000. I, I'll increase it slowly. So, you know, maybe it's 1,200, 1,500, slowly over the course of a month or a couple of weeks. So it's a slow increase to allow myself to kind of adjust to the, the position size. So usually the emotions not, for me at least, it's not from the position sizing. It's just from doing stupid things. Like if I add to a loser, for example. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, have you ever uh, used or consider using chat GPT for um, for your investing or trading? Um, just AI in general. I think mm -hmm. I'm starting to kind of explore the avenue, but I don't think it's ready quite yet. I think at the moment it still requires a lot of human effort, which is fine. But I think eventually we'll get there overall in trading. Mm -hmm. What kind of rules have you set? for your trading and how did you come to discover and create them? Um, I think it's from, I do a lot of journaling. So it's from your from my journals. I, I create rules for myself. For example, something I find is like, I, I usually trade more on my red days. Uh, and then let's say on a green day, I'll place four trades on my red days on average. I, I, I was looking at this a uh, couple months ago. On my red days, I'll trade six to seven trades. So knowing that a lot of times about like in trading, making money is one aspect, but the other aspect is trying to lose less, right? That's, 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 that's the, the other aspect a lot of people don't think about. A lot of times you need to analyze your losses and look at, okay, on the red days, if I just stop trading after three losses, what would my P&L look like? So delete those losses. That's what I did. Delete the losses after the third trade. And I realized, oh my God, my red days will be so much smaller if I just stop trading after the third trade on my red days. Right. So, so I did a lot of that to create those rules of, okay, you can only trade until uh, nine o'clock your local time, or you can only, you know, take three losses on the day and be done. What were the things that finally clicked for you in your trading? That was a turning point for you where you started to become consistently profitable and, um, how long did it take? Did you say it was like two, three years? Yeah, I became profitable after two years. Mm -hmm. um, and then I realized it was and after year one, I started more, taking risk management more seriously. So that's the big part where I used to have varying amounts of risk for all the different trades I'll take. So on, like on small cap, I'll be risking at $200. On a big cap, I'll be risking 50, vice versa. So it's a little bit too erratic. So what I found out is if I risk, so it all goes back to my journals. If I go, go back to my journal and kind of look at my entries and exits and the share sizes I'll take, I'm taking varying amounts of risk. But if I set the risk constant, at these four, at the very beginning, every trade, I'd say every trade now, instead of risking, you know, all the different amounts, every trade, the risk is now $50 or for me at a time, $50, then, then I will see more success in terms of managing my risk because the risk then will be kept around 50 uh, with slippage, maybe 56, um, $60 slippage. Um, but then like this way it controls my risk to, okay, so my max risk on the day is, for example, like, you know, two X my risk. So that's how I realized that, okay, I should be, you know, looking at my position sizes from a risk reward perspective, rather than thinking how much I want to make, uh, which is like kind of the opposite of what most traders do. 
Uh-huh. Uh, and then do you, how often do you add to your winners? Uh, and if so, is it a significant amount? Yeah. So after, so it's only after I started, you know, managing the risk. So keeping it constant, then I'll look at on my journal, okay, which other setups that I'm best at usually where I'll make, you know, like three X or four X the risk, then I'll only add into winners on those particular setups. And all the other ones, I'll use the same lot of risk. So maybe for the good ones I'm really good at, I'll 2x my risk on those trades. I see. So yeah. so your uh what you would consider your A class setups, you yeah. would, uh double the amount that you that you apply to that trade? Yes. So at the time, because I was trading still relatively small, doubling mm-hmm. my risk overnight, it was still manageable because we're talking about $50 risk at the time. So doubling that would be $100 risk. It's a lot for me at a time, but I was kind of pushing myself more into doing that. And that that works better because in my opinion, a lot of traders, when they add size, they add size for all the setups they have. But you should add size to your best setups. I see. So for those traders who are struggling, you know, and hurting right now, uh, any advice uh, you'd give them? Um, I think... You want to make sure you have a robust journal. You want to go and then look at some patterns in terms of your own human behavior, uh, whether your mistakes or emotions, or whether it's your position sizes, for example, from your journals. That's kind of, you have to review them, both your winners and your losers, because if you treat each and every single day as like a brand new day and you don't journal anything you you there's never gonna be any any pattern or routine that you can establish for yourself everything will be random um and the market is random enough right so (laughs) the only thing you can control is kind of how you trade so for people who are not tracking the setups in your journal um they need to I, i highly recommend you to start doing that so uh, in the kind of broad economic news, uh, we've heard about the, you know, different banks blowing up uh, Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic. Uh, have you changed anything about your trading style or how much money you keep with the broker as a result of these uh, bank blow ups? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, in the in the States, I think it's up to 250000 uh, for all the deposits as well as the 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 broker accounts in Canada, so yeah, so I make sure if my brokerage accounts are with the states with the U.S., I keep it max at two fifty k. But my Canadian ones, the Canadian uh, regulation is a lot different. Uh, where deposits were only insured for up to hundred k, but the broker accounts you are insured for up to a million. Mm. So that I did, I did re redid some like asset al- allocation, looking at my trading accounts. But yeah, so yeah, after seeing what happened to SVB, I, I got a lot more cautious, um, especially with my U.S. exposures. So to wrap things up, what do you struggle with most? I think I, I'm a I'm a very stubborn person. I think a lot you hear a lot of traders say that. Uh-huh. So <laughs> I've gotten a lot better over the years, knowing when I should stop. Um, but but being, you know, we all have a little bit of DJing in us. And being that I'm still, you know, sometimes I still feel like I'm a DJ. I think a lot of times I, I do struggle with uh, <laughs> with stepping away even till this day. So that's kind of my biggest struggle. Not every single day, but like it probably shows up once every month where I'll just keep on fighting and trying to make it work. Um, but yeah, so I'm a lot better at it now. It used to be every week or every other week, but now it's once a month where I have to fight my over trading tendencies and not be a degen. I, I see. So we- uh, beware of revenge trading, right? Yeah, revenge trading, trying to go back uh, to make it work or go back to a stock that I lost money on yesterday and make it work and think that's revenge on the stock. It, it's really uh-huh. stupid, but <laughs> yeah. I mean, traders, what kind of, what kind of, you have to be kind of a little bit insane, a little bit weird, <laughs> out of whack to want to do this thing for a living, right? 
Yeah, exactly. So if a close friend or a family member asked you if they should get into trading, uh, what would you tell them? I think it depends on their situation. I would say if you have $5,000 lying around that you can you can afford to lose, then, then it's great. It's a great way to start learning about the market and to see if the, if this, the skill potentially is something that you can utilize to make like the, the amount of upside in trading is insane as long as you are okay risking an initial capital. Um, so I, I'd say, you know, if you can afford to lose the what the first two thousand or three thousand dollars you have or five thousand, then that's great. Um, but then if you are trading with the last five thousand dollars you have in your bank account, I would say don't trade. Mm-hmm. Right. So so uh trading with just kind of gambling money in a way. Exactly. Yeah. You, especially in the first year, you, most people will probably lose it all. <laughs> you got a good reminder. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show, Shay. Uh, how can our listeners get in touch with you? Uh, thank you, Ian, for having me. Um, and if people want to uh, get in touch, you can check out my YouTube channel, Humboldt Trader, or on my, I'm, I'm also on uh, Instagram, Humboldt Trader as well. And uh, my Twitter is Humboldt Trader 18. Fantastic, Shay. Thank you for coming on Chat with Traders. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Tessa. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders. But rest assured, there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes. And we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders. 